All right, so quick introductions. My name is John Dietz. I think I know everybody here, but just in case I don't, I got my real estate license in 2002 and uh, sold one home my first six months. So I was crushing it, hashtag sarcasm. Yeah. And then something happened for me that caused me to get pretty serious about my real estate business. And in the second six months of my real estate career, I sold 60 houses. And I went on to sell an average of about 100 a year, uh, 100 to 120 sales a year, never worked with a buyer, only worked on the listing side of the business. Uh, if you're here to learn more about buyer consultations, you're in the wrong class. It's down the hall to the right. <laughs> and if you are here to master your listing presentation, then you're in the right room. Please sit down. I'll make this as entertaining as possible for you. And... One of the things that happened for me from the first six, six months to the next six months was I realized in order for me to be successful in real estate, I was going to have to learn my listing presentation. I'd been in sales pretty much from the time I graduated college uh, until I got into real estate. So I kind of understood the concept of lead generation. What I didn't have a clue was when I go to the seller's home, what do I say? What do I do in order to uh, sell my services over someone else, especially when I'm brand new to real estate? Why would they hire me when they're meeting with real estate agents who have been in the business a lot longer than I had been? And the answer for me was to master this listing presentation. Now, at the time, there was a class. Uh, the title of the class was Listing Your Way to Success. And I marked it in my calendar every time that class was being taught in the state of Florida for the next six months. I think I probably went 18 times. And I practiced, drilled, rehearsed my listening presentation in order to master it at a high level. Now, what that did for me is, of course, I had better conversion ratios because I did that. But the real reason it was so important is it gave me the confidence to get on the phone and schedule appointments. I mean, after all, if you get to the plate and you know you're going to strike out, how excited are you at getting to the plate? If you know that you're going to get to the plate and you're going to hit a home run, then put me in coach. I want to hit the ball. So this is uh, your opportunity to master that listing presentation so that you can get in the game and hit home runs. All right, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started. All right, you should be looking at a screen with a picture of uh, a little house that says 14 point listing presentation. Somebody could take yourself off mute and just say, that's what we're looking at, John. Yes, yeah, see it. Thank you, Clarissa. You're the best. All right, let's get started. Step, well, before we get to step one, uh, follow the Yellow Brick Road. So I like to simplify things. I think a lot of people want to make things more complicated than they are. And after all, if it's not complicated, it probably doesn't work. And I think that simplicity is the ultimate form of sophistication. I think the path to get from where you are where you want to be is as simple as follow the yellow brick road. Now, another way for us to have this conversation is think of it like a recipe. If I was going to bake a cake and you said, you know, John, I want you to make a German chocolate cake. Don't ask me why I picked that. I have no idea. And I go into the kitchen. I just start looking for ingredients, pouring them into a pan um, mixing them up. I have no idea what goes in a German chocolate cake. And I put that thing in the oven. I don't even know what temperature to put it on or how long to leave it in there. It's probably not going to be very good. I doubt anybody is coming for seconds. You guys probably won't even, won't, won't even take one bite. Now you give me the recipe. I could probably come pretty close to making a pretty good German chocolate cake. However, if I follow 90% of the recipe, the cake's still gonna suck. It's not gonna suck as much, but it's gonna suck. Now, if I put 100% of the ingredients in exactly the way that I'm supposed to, probably gonna taste pretty good. 
All right. It's the same thing with this. If you follow the recipe to build a successful listing presentation and you follow it step by step by step, you're going to be successful. If you try to wing it, it's going to be anywhere from mediocre to not very good. And bottom line is you're not going to get the same results. So follow it step by step. Step one, schedule the appointment. If I could show you how I could sell your home for more money in less time, would you be interested in seeing how I could do that? Now, let me explain this, this close for a listing appointment. It's a curiosity question, meaning I'm gonna get yes more often than no. If I could show you how I could sell your home for more money in less time, would you be interested in seeing how I could do that? Now, the other thing I want to point out is show you. Show you means it has to be a face-to-face -face appointment because you're going to have people that are going to ask you, can't you just tell me? No, we need to get together so I can show you what I can do in order to sell your home for more money in less time. Here's the other thing. I'm not ready to put my home on the market. Sure, I understand. And my goal is just to show you what I can do to sell your home for more money and less time. Um, just out of curiosity, just so you know what I can do, even if you don't do anything with it now, at least maybe three months from now, four months from now, when you are ready, you'll know what I can do. So you're going to get yes more often than you would if you asked, hey, can I come over and, and, and talk about listing your house? Um, don't use that close. All right. All right, so you've got the appointment. Step two, maybe. We'll see if I can get the screen to move. Fabulous. Hold on one second. Oh, there we go. All right, step two. That was scary. All right, step two is soft interview. Before I come over to your home, I'm gonna just pick names that I see on my computer screen here. MJ Taylor, hi MJ. Before I come to MJ's home, I am going to call MJ and I'm gonna ask questions. It's a soft interview. Don't skip this. I've skipped this step before and I've always regretted that I did. So I've talked to Clarissa. We scheduled an appointment for later today and I let her know that I'm going to reach out to her and ask her some additional questions. Script. MJ, before we meet tomorrow, I'm going to give you a call probably later today or tomorrow morning and ask you some questions. Uh, it's information that I need in order to prepare for our appointment so I can do a better job. I'll only need maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Can we set that up for tomorrow at 9 a.m.? Now, I've done this a couple different ways. I've made the calls. I've had an assistant make the call. And even though you can leverage this and still get the information, I think it's better if you're actually the one who's making the call because it's the beginning of building that relationship. And when you're asking the questions, if you can hear the tonality and you can hear how they're answering the questions and you're getting more information that you wouldn't have if somebody just handed you a list of the answers. All right, so how long have you lived in your home? Easy question, right? Um, what updates have you made to your home? Now, if they've lived in their home for 20 or 30 years, ask them specifically, what kind of updates have you made in the last two or three years? Otherwise, you're going to get updates they made like 10, 15 years ago. All right. So what kind of updates have you made in the last two or three years? Now, as they're mentioning the updates they've made, just write everything down. They're, they might tell you, for those of you who live in the state of Florida like I do, they might tell you they planted a new grapefruit tree out back. It's important to them. Write it down. All right. Now, 
how many beds and baths do you have? Now, can you get that information through public records, through previous listings? Of course you can, but ask them anyways. You don't want to show up to a listing appointment and have the wrong information. Simply ask, how many bedrooms does your home have? How many bathrooms does your home have? All right. Uh, what is the square footage? Same thing. Can you get that information on public records? Yes, ask them anyways. You don't wanna show up with comparables for a 2,400 square foot home and, and find out that their home is actually 2,800 square foot and you've got all the wrong information. Now we're looking for square footage under air. This, so for example, it doesn't include the garage, it doesn't include the lanai, it, it's square footage under air, living square footage. All right. Location, what am I looking for here? Uh, where does your Where is your home? Uh, does it back up to water? Does it back up to a conservation? Is it back to a lake? Does it back to a pond? Does it back to the Atlantic Ocean? Where in the neighborhood is your home? All right, it's super important. Now, you can go online and you can do a Google search, for example, and you can see a picture of where the property is. And I still recommend you do that. However, you need to ask the seller this question as well. Okay, based on recent sales, what do you feel your, your value is? Where do you see your home selling? What is the value of your home? Now, the seller may say they don't have any idea or that's why you're coming. And if they say that, simply say, I understand and move on to the next question. However, if they give you a number, this is critically important. Just write it down. MJ, if they give you a number of, let's say, $500,000 and you know the home's not going to sell for more than three fifty, dollars and they tell you they've got the best house in the neighborhood, and they know it's worth five hundred thousand dollars. And your response is simply okay. It is not. Are you nuts? You're not going to get five hundred thousand dollars for your home. Now we don't get into a conversation at this point. We're Colombo, and we're just asking questions. All right. Are you interviewing other agents? Yes. Ask that question. Some real estate agents feel like they might be planting a seed. In other words, the seller wasn't thinking about this before. Trust me, they were. Ask them, are you interviewing other agents? Now, here's the one question I want you to ask that's not on your screen. When they answer that question, I want you to follow that up with, are you meeting with me first? Now, ideally, you want to be first. And the reason you want to be first, Joanne, is because you can stop the shop. If I can meet with you before you meet with Jessica and I close and you tell me, well, I have a meeting with Jessica, I'm going to isolate that objection. In other words, if you didn't have a meeting with Jessica, am I the right agent for the job? Now, when you say yes, I'm going to share with you why you would actually be doing Jessica a favor if you were to cancel that listing appointment and you're gonna hire me. Joanne, talk to me. I wanted to ask if you're emailing us the presentation because I'm taking notes, but I don't know if I should write down everything. Take notes. And it is it is being recorded and I will send you the recording and I will send you the PowerPoint slide. Thank you. Yeah, and still take notes. So you guys are on camera. I can tell if you're taking notes or not. I'm watching you. <laughs> why, why is that? Why do I want you to take notes? Because you're going to get it better if you write it down. <clears throat> All right. Now, if you're not the first agent, I want you to make sure that you are asking them a question. Emma, here's the question. I know I'm not meeting with you first, so I'm going to ask you a favor. Emma, got it. I'm meeting with you tomorrow at 5 p.m. And I know you're meeting with other agents before you meet with me. Can I ask you a favor? They're going to say yes, guys. Here's the question. Here's the favor. Would you promise me you won't make a decision until you meet with me? 
Now, by asking them that question, they're verbalizing, they're making a commitment that they're not going to make a decision before they meet with you. Now, if I'm coming in and I'm meeting with them and I, and, and I ask them to cancel their appointment with you and hire me, they're going to tell me, John, I can't because I promised Jessica that I would meet with her. Simple, guys. Would you promise me you won't make a decision until you meet with me? Here's the other thing you can do that will greatly increase the odds that you're going to get the listing, even though you're not the first person to meet with them. Make sure you're using a pre-listing presentation packet that you either are going to send to them, email to them, hand deliver to their front door, or have a courier service deliver it to them. Now, the purpose of the pre-listing package is so that you can share everything about you, your resume, what you do to market your listings, uh, the service that they're going to receive by hiring you. And that way they can read about you. Um, so when you show up, you can focus on their goals rather than talk about how, how awesome you are. All right, have you thought about selling your home by owner? Ask them. I promise you they're thinking about it. Now, Randy, if you hear, yeah, that's a possibility, then you can work that into your presentation, all right? You can overcome that objection um, proactively versus reactively. All right, where are you moving when your home sells and how soon would you like to be there? Where are you moving when your home sells and how, how soon would you like to be there? You're not asking this question to get a buyer. I know it sounds like that. And I don't want you to put on your buyer hat, not yet, You buyer's agent hat. You are, this is a listing conversation. You could talk to them later about buying a home. The reason you're asking them, where are you moving when your home sells and how soon would you like to be there is motivation. That's it. I wanna see what their motivation is. All right, step three, preparation. Pull the public records. Uh, research previous listings, enter that address into the MLS um, without any dates and see how many times it's been on the MLS. Pull any previous times, lit times that was on the MLS. Uh, in order to do your comparative market analysis, pull every single property in the neighborhood that sold in the last six months so let me pause on that for just a moment. I know the market's shifting, depending on where you live, it's shifting a little bit, it's shifting a lot, or it hasn't shifted at all. And a lot of times real estate agents will say, John, shouldn't we just look at comparables for the last three months? Because after all, the market's really changed. I get it. And you're gonna pay more attention to those homes that sold most recently and you want to pull everything that sold in the last six months. Why? Because the seller knows about them. And you don't want to show up on an appointment and have a seller say, why didn't you bring that property over around the corner from us at 123 Palm Street? It looks like you're not prepared. So bring everything that sold within the last six months. Here's the other thing. Bring everything that sold, whether it's comparable or not, Another mistake a lot of real estate agents make is they only bring the comparable properties. And then the same thing happens. A seller says, well, what about Tom and Mary's house down the street? It sold three months ago and you didn't bring it. Now it looks like you didn't do your job. I want you to bring it. And I want you to show them when you're showing them the comparables, Tom and Mary's home has 3,400 square foot their home has 2,000. So it's not a comparable property. We're not going to use this as a comparable. However, I don't leave any stones unturned. So I brought every home in your neighborhood that sold in the last six months. Script. Emma, hand up. Talk to me. Um, How far out? Because if it's like a rural property, things like that, where there is no neighborhood, because that's what I'm struggling with at the moment with the listing. Yeah, follow the rules that an appraiser would follow. So if the appraiser says they'll go out a mile, then go out a mile. If it's two miles, then go out two miles. The bottom line is though, you gotta pull data. So 
you're going to go out as far as you have to go out to find comparable properties. The challenge is by going further out, you're going to you, you're going to end up in some areas where the home may be comparable in size, but it's not comparable. Okay, thank you. Now, when I'm really having a difficult time coming up with a price, I'm going to talk to the seller about getting an appraisal before we put their home on the market. And, and that way we can market the property as being sold at appraised value or below appraised value. Now, when you're pulling your comparables, make sure you also pull all of the active listings, whether they are comparable or not. Again, we're not leaving any stones unturned. If there's anything for sale by owner, bring that. Pull tax records for homes that sold so that you can find anything that sold that wasn't listed. In other words, it was a for sale by owner, but you didn't miss it because you don't leave any stone unturned. Script. All right. You're going to do a supply and demand analysis in your preparation. Now, we're going to talk more about a supply and demand analysis in just a little bit. But what we're looking for here is how many homes within a certain price range within a two to three mile radius of our subject property are for sale. That's supply. How many sold in the last six months divided by six in order to get a number of homes that are selling every 30 days? That's demand. And then we take the number of homes selling every 30 days and we divide that into the number of active listings. And that gives us the absorption ratio. That lets us know that we have two months of inventory, three months, six months, whatever the number is. All right, we're gonna go deeper into that. So if it feels like I flew through that I did, but I'm coming back to it. Emma, same thing on this. You're just, rather than looking in a radius around the property of two to three miles, it may be five miles. It just depends on the property. All right, step four. Confirm the appointment and trial close. So I have an appointment with Levi at 5 p.m. I'm going to call him ahead of time and I'm going to confirm the appointment. Simply, hey, Levi, John Dietz, confirming our appointment for later today at 4 p.m. Levi says, yep, yeah, John, looking forward to seeing you at 4. Cool. Now, Levi, when I meet with you later today at 4 p.m., if I'm able to show you that I'm the right agent for the job, are you ready to get started today? Trial close. Super important. Now, why would we not use a trial close prior to going? Yeah, I'm pausing because I need to quit talking for a moment and I want to hear you guys talk. Tell me why do you think we don't do this? Because we don't. Maybe you're insecure that they might say no or that you sound insecure by asking it. There's one of the reasons, Joanne, 100%. That's a 100% fact. Or maybe we fear that they are going to feel cornered if you're asking them up front without you doing your presentation. There you go, Tulio. That's it. That's the other reason. <clears throat> now, maybe there's another reason, but those are the two that I know of. All right, this is what professionals do. When we get together later today at 4 p.m. So let me start from the beginning. Joanne, it's John Dietz with Blank Real Estate Company. I'm super excited to come over and see you later today at 4 p.m. Just confirming when we get together, are you ready to put your home on the market today? Well, we're thinking in the next couple of weeks, John, but... Cool. We can talk about that. Great. See you at four. Did that did that feel like I was pushy? Did it feel did you feel like I was pushing you, Joanne? No. Okay. Now you have to have the confidence that you are the right agent for the job. You are the absolutely the best agent for the job. My mindset is um, I owe it to you to help you make the best decision. Because if you hire the wrong agent, you're gonna have a horrible experience. 
So it, it's absolute confidence. Now that's not ego, it's not arrogance, but it's confidence. So when we meet later today, if I'm able to show you that I'm the right agent for the job, are you ready to get started today? Or when we get together later today at 4 p.m., are you ready to put your home on the market? Either one of those is good. If I hear yes, cool, it's mine to go get. If I hear anything else but yes, the answer is awesome. See you at four. Just finding out. All right, step five. This is your second confirmation call. You are on the way. It is 4.30. You have that appointment. Pardon me? Five. And okay. I, hold on one second, guys. I'm going to hit mute all just because of background noise. Yeah, it didn't work. There we go. Anything else? There we go. Okay. Somebody's at the drive thru. Get me something. All right. Daryl, it's good to see you, my friend. So I'm on my way to Daryl's house and I called Daryl. Hey, Daryl, it's John Dietz. I'm on my way. Should be at your front door right at 5 p.m. Daryl says, See you at five. See you at five. And if I run into traffic, I'm running a few minutes behind, I'll call you and let you know. Otherwise, I'll be there right at 5 p.m. Okay, don't worry about it. Now, if I didn't confirm the appointment on the first confirmation call, I have a second opportunity here. Hey, Daryl, by the way, are you ready to put your home on the market today? Um, if everything makes sense, I don't awesome. see a problem with it. Awesome. See you at five. All right. Step six, get on the listing channel. Now, the listing channel is not in your car. Don't go turning the knob looking for a listing channel. <laughs> this is a mindset conversation. Listing channel is get your mindset right. Give me one second, guys. I'm going to change something here. Okay, we're good. Get your mindset right. Uh, don't turn on the radio especially if it's talk radio and it's negative talk radio. I love election time, listening to talk radio and being sarcastic because I don't. And you hear these people having these negative conversations and it's not helping your mindset. If anything, it's making you mad. And that's not the right mindset to walk into that listing appointment with. It's positive thoughts. It's it, 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 I want you to visualize the result that you want. I want you to be able to see yourself knocking on the front door, having a great conversation with that seller as they open the door, touring their house, making a great impression, sitting down at the kitchen table, delivering a great listing presentation, overcoming objections and closing so that before you actually walk in the door, you've already got the listing. You're not, you have the right mindset because you got on the listing channel. Don't answer your phone. If your phone rings, it could be good news. It could be bad news. It could be something that really frustrates you. Don't answer the phone. I'm going on a listing appointment this one time. This is many years ago and I'm pulling up front in front of the home. And right as I'm getting ready to put my car in park, my phone rings. So what did I do? I answered the phone. And it was the office letting me know that a listing that I had that was supposed to close the next day was falling apart. All of a sudden, it's the end of the world. And I need this and I need this and this and this. What do you think my mindset was like going into that appointment? Not very good. By the way, the home that the, the the call that I got the property list the property closed the next day and I didn't get the listing <laughs> so better off not answering the phone all right step seven step seven is your Kodak moment this is you greeting the seller at the front door now prior to greeting them at the front door there's a few things that need to happen in order for this to happen. First of all, you need to get in the neighborhood early enough that you can park in the street, not the driveway, and get to their door right at 5 p.m. If that's what time your appointment is, 
being on time is 5 p.m. It's not 5.05 and it's not 4.55. 4.55, you're early and they're freaking out because then they're, they're inside running around trying to put the kids' toys away before you knock on the door. So you're not winning any friends by being five minutes early. You're definitely not winning any friends by being five minutes late, especially if you're meeting with somebody who's an analytical, who's a high C personality. Um, you ask them what they do for a living and they tell you they're an engineer. Well, you're done. You're not going to get that because you're five minutes late. Now, if you get in the neighborhood early, drive around the neighborhood, look at the comparable properties, uh, look for 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 sale by owners because you can call them later and get another listing. Don't park in front of the home and sit there for 10 minutes. That makes you a stalker. That doesn't make you on time. Now you're a stalker. All right, so drive around, pull up in front of the house a few minutes early, grab your things, walk up to the front door and go to a new screen so I can find somebody new. Gina answers the door. I knock on the door. I'm not ringing the bell. Why? Well, because I read this book called How to Master the Art of Listing and Selling Real Estate. And Tom Hopkins said, always knock on the door, never ring the bell. So I do that. Now, one of the reasons is, is because I cannot enthusiastically ring the doorbell, but I can enthusiastically knock on the door. Here's another reason. If they have kids and they've got a baby in the back of the house and the baby's sleeping and I just woke up the baby and they were counting on the baby being down for a nap during our listing presentation, uh, again, I'm not winning any friends. So I'm knocking on the door. Gina answers the door. Hi, Gina. John Dietz. We had an appointment for 5 p.m. and it's 5 p.m. May I come in? Now. Hi, John. Yes, hi, hi come in. Wait, it's so good to see you. <laughs> All right. Now, Gina, hang in here with me for a moment. Don't go away. So let's say I knock on your door, you open the door, and my and I greet you with, hi, Gina, my name is John Dietz. I'm a real estate agent for, with Blank Real Estate Company. We had an appointment at 5 p.m., and I'm here to sell your house. Um, I'm a high eye, so you would have lost me at that right. moment. <laughs> right? <laughs> Right? Hey, Gina, John Dietz. We had an appointment at 4 p.m. and it's 4 p.m. May I come in? Absolutely. Now, come in. All right. Now, let's say that Gina is a high S or we're talking disc personality types here, guys. Let's say she's a high S or a high C and I'm not going to show up as a super high I. Um, let's say she's older, right? And... Uh, I, I, I want to tone it down, all right? Um, hi, Gina, my name is John Dietz. We had an appointment at 4 p.m. It's 4 p.m., may I come in? Yes. All right, same conversation, right? Just don't be the boring version. Gina, John, appointment for, can I come in? That doesn't work, all right? <laughs> That's the robot version. Now, the moment you walk in that door, this is part of your Kodak moment. The moment you walk in the door, the first thing I want you to do is look around the house. We are franchising your listing presentation. If you go into if you go into Chick-fil-A in Palm Harbor, Florida, you're going to have exactly the same experience as if you go into Chick-fil-A in Charlotte, North Carolina. All right. If you say thank you, you're going to hear exactly the same response, which is it's my pleasure. All right. We want to franchise your listing presentation. The moment they open that door, hi, Tulio, my name is John Dietz. We had an appointment at 4 p.m. and it's 4 p.m. May I come in? Now, the moment you walk in that front door, Randy, wow, you have a beautiful home. I'm super excited to be here and I'm excited for this opportunity to help you sell your home. All right, let's pause for a moment. Why is that important? All right. If you study neuro linguistic programming, NLP, sell your home, sell your home is an embedded command. List with me, an embedded command, okay? If you listen to the franchise version of the listing presentation that I'm teaching you, they are full of embedded commands. All right, back to on role play. 
So I'm excited to be here and I'm excited for this opportunity to help you sell your home. Now, what I would like to do next is I would love it if you can give me a tour of your home, Tulio. However, before we do that, would it be okay if I set my things down at the kitchen table? Absolutely. Okay, why is that important? Thank you, Tulio. It's important because this is where you want to meet with them. If you ask them, where would you like to sit? You're going to end up in, in, in the living room, sitting on a couch with them across the room on another couch. And now you're hollering at one another, having a conversation, trying to show them comparables from 10 feet across the room, and it's not going well. The kitchen table is where business gets done. That's where they sit to write the bills or to discuss uh their budget that's where they do that's where the family does business the dining room table is where they entertain joanne take yourself off mute talk to me i have a tendency out of gratitude i usually say something like this and i'm not sure if i should change it i usually say john i'm grateful to be here for the opportunity to earn your business do you think that's not forward enough i love it i do my my question is well, my first question is, is it working for you? It is, but I tend to work with people that already know, like, and trust me, and I'm trying to expand my horizons. Okay. So if I didn't know you, Joanne, I'm just, a, I'm just a sales trainer and coach, and I'm giving you an answer based on study and what we know. I would tell you the biggest challenge with what you're using is it's not an embedded command and embedded commands work. Got it. Okay. Joanne, you have, Joanne you have kids? Mm-hmm. Right? When you go in their room and it's a mess, what do you say? <laughs> clean it up. <laughs> do, you, do you ever say clean your room? I do. Like, what does it sound like? Tell me what it sounds like. You You're better up? clean up this mess or else. Okay. Clean up this mess, clean up this mess, clean up this mess. It's a downswing, it's an embedded command, right? Okay. You wouldn't walk in and go, clean up the mess, <laughs> right? No. Okay, you have authority because you're not happy and you want them to clean up their room. All right, I told Lacey- Less that with I'm me. Yeah. I told Lacey that one time when she was little and I said, your room is a mess. And she goes, I like my room a mess. <laughs> <laughs> that girl melted my heart from day one. <laughs> All right. So let's see back to Emma. So Emma, I love it. If you would take me on a tour of your home. Um, however, I'd like to set my things down at the kitchen table first. All right. So I'm going to go to the kitchen table. I'm going to set my things down. I'm gonna set them on the floor. Do not put your things on top of the table, all right? Either on the floor or on your chair. Ask them, where would you like me to sit? If you go to the kitchen table and you just pull out a chair and you're at Archie Bunker's house, you're gonna have some dude looking at you the whole time you're there thinking, he's in my chair, he's in my chair, he's in my chair. What do I do? He's in my chair. If you don't know who Archie Bunker is, just Google it, okay? So ask them where they want you to sit. Now, I want you to grab a pen and a, and a notebook. A pen and a notebook. Joanne, as we tour your home, I'm gonna ask you some questions and I'm gonna take a lot of notes, all right? It's not this awkward when you're at the home because you don't have to hold it up for them to see them. I'm just doing this because it's Zoom, right? All right, I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to take some notes because this is the information I'm going to use to sell your home. Now, you're not going to say that in real life. It's going to sound more like this is the information I'm going to use to sell your home. Embedded command. So, Joanne, as we're touring your home, I'm going to take some, I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to take some notes because this is the information I'm going to use to sell your home. All right. Step eight, tour their home, take notes, ask questions, be enthusiastic, like their home, 
Oh my gosh, can't believe I have to say that. Now, as you're taking notes, I want you to speak out loud. In, in other words, beautiful family room, vaulted ceilings, hardwood floors. Man, I love the family room. Wood burning fireplace. I'm saying things as I'm writing them down because I want the seller to hear that I am taking time to recognize what I love most about their home because they love their home. I'm demonstrating to them that I care enough to take notes that are gonna enable me to sell their home. Three questions that every seller is asking themselves about you, me, and everybody else the moment you show up at the front door. Do you care about me? Can I trust you? Do you know what you're doing? Now, I'm going to convey, I care about you. You can trust me. I know what I'm doing every moment that I'm in the house, including touring their home. Now, what kind of questions would I ask in order to be able to sell their home? Well, how old's your roof? I can tell that you have brand new windows. When did you replace the windows? Wow, you have an amazing, beautiful kitchen. The countertops, are they granite? Ask, because unless you're better than I am, you're not gonna be able to tell what type of countertops they have unless you ask. Ask them specific questions. What type of cabinets are these? What type of flooring is it? It's, so, I used to say, here's, here's a moment of me going out being vulnerable. Guys, don't laugh at me. So in teaching this class, I used to say granite countertops, maple cabinets, stainless steel appliances, and travertine floors. And I had somebody recently ask me, John, what's travertine floors? So I'm like showing how dated I am, right, Tulio? And... Tulio works with builders, so I know he's really laughing. He's like, John, they just don't build houses like that anymore. I'm like, all right, that's, what do they do? All right, that was a bunny trail, sorry. Ask questions. Don't skip part of the house. Every single part of the house counts. Go out, go out back. I know for all of you in Florida, in the summertime, it's like 110 degrees outside with 100% humidity and you don't want to go outside, go outside. You need to see every single part of their home. Speaking of going out back, if their home backs to water and there's boats on in the canal, how big of a boat can I have behind your home? Are there any fixed bridges that I need to go under in, in order to get to the ocean? Or if you're on the west coast of Florida, the Gulf of Mexico, it makes a big difference in who you're going to sell their home to and it makes a big difference in pricing their home. Now, your job is not to stage their property. Your job is not to point out what's wrong with their home. Your job is to be enthusiastic and like their home. I've had a lot of homeowners say to me, you know, John, so-and-so was over at my house and they didn't even like it. How are they gonna sell it? My response is, I love your home, hire me. So be enthusiastic and like their home. Don't walk into the kid's bedroom and go, purple walls, pink carpet. What the heck were you thinking? This has got to go, that's got to go. And then just start walking through the house and staging their home. Yeah, there's real estate agents who do that and don't be that person. Be enthusiastic and like their home. Now, if the seller asks you if you'll stage their home, here's your response. Script. Once you hire me, once you hire me, I will walk through your house and help you stage it. Or I have a professional stager who will come through your home and help you stage your home. Whichever you do, make sure they understand that's part of your service that you offer once they hire you. Don't go there and start staging their home. Chances are one of two things. You're either going to offend them because you're going to tell them they need to do something, like you're going to tell them to take down the wallpaper in the kitchen and that's their favorite part of the house. Hmm. 
walk through the home and stage the property with them after they hire you. Now, if they walk into a room and they say, you know, I was thinking of painting this room, what do you think? All right, minor, right? My response to that would be, I would. That's it, I would. John, I was thinking of taking up the carpet and putting new carpet in this room. What do you think? I would. Nothing wrong with that. Now, there's a big difference between that and I was thinking of gutting the kitchen and spending $50,000 to put in a new kitchen. Don't respond with I would. <laughs> that would be a horrible answer because they're not going to get $50,000 more for their house because they put $50,000 into updating the kitchen. My response to that would be, let's wait until we look at the comparables and we talk pricing strategy. All right. I'm going to pause. Any questions? We're halfway through, guys. Just a comment because I tend to take too long on listing appointments. And okay. so what I'm reflecting is that I should pause in situations and hold some of it until after I'm hired. And I have seen before when people are like, oh, I'm going to paint. And I say, yeah, that's a great idea. And then I come back and I probably could have given them some suggestions on the paint because just the light neutral, you know, there's there's trends that you can follow. And then I come back and it's like, OK, well, gray is out. You know, we could we could switch to what is popular now, but you go back and it's all gray and you're like, well, they could have done better. Okay, this is somebody who hired you. I don't have, with the with this specific example, I don't have a listing agreement with them, but that was a business choice and maybe lack of experience a little bit, but they will, they are using me, hopefully, okay. to sell the home. Okay, so they talked about painting. You responded with, I would, you came back and they painted absolutely the wrong color. It's not terrible. I just said this this is fine for this room, but for the rest of the house, let's talk about color because there are there are choices that will be more popular in this market. All right. Really good point. Really good point. And in all the years I did this, I never had a situation where I said I would and I came back and it was purple or something. So uh, that's a really good point, Joanne. Right? What color are you thinking? There's another question for you guys. So I was thinking of painting this room. What do you think? What color were you thinking? Purple. No! <laughs> All right. It's just for fun. But thank you, Joanne. That's a really good point. Wrong direction. All right. Step nine, begin the conversation. You are sitting at the kitchen table. And I have... Tulio and MJ sitting across the table from me. Now, when I sit down, I'm going to make sure that I'm sitting at the table so that I can see both Tulio and MJ at the same time. If you ask them where they want you to sit and they put you on the side of the table and each of them are on each end of the table, in other words, you're doing this to look at one and then you're doing this to look at the other, and it feels like you're at a tennis match, change the table. I want to be able to see both Tulio and MJ at the same time. There's nothing wrong with asking them if we change seats, all right? You're in charge. Now, here's the other thing. If there's something on the, on the table like a big vase of flowers, ask them if you can move it. Now, I'll always use humor and ask, is it okay if we move this? Because if we don't, I'll probably knock it over. <laughs> And it gets in the way of us having this conversation. So I want it to be off the table. Uh, if they offer you something to drink, the answer is always yes. If they don't offer you a glass of water, ask if you can have a glass of water. You're going to do a lot of talking. You're going to get thirsty. You also want to see if the water has gone before you're finished. That means you did too much talking. All right. So if they ask, yes, I would love a glass of water. Now, always begin with gratitude. Tulio and MJ, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Thank you for meeting with me. It is an honor 
and a privilege to meet with you and discuss the po possibility of helping you sell your home. Now, I'd like to start by sharing my mission statement with you. My mission is to meet your goals and exceed your expectations. Now, because of that mission statement, now I'm sharing my mission statement with them in order to set up the expectations conversation. Make sure you get that, all right? It's important, don't leave it out. My mission is to meet your goals and exceed your expectation, expectations. Now, because of that mission statement, whenever I meet with a potential seller, works for buyers too, by the way, whenever I meet with a potential seller, one of three things typically happens. One of those three things will happen today. They either hire me, they either understand and appreciate the benefits that I have to offer, and they hire me, which is awesome. Or they don't hire me, which isn't so awesome. And the third thing that occasionally happens is I may choose not to represent them in the sale of their home. Now, I'm going to pause right there, just like I did. So, Levi, whenever I meet with a potential seller, one of three things typically happens. One of those three things will happen today. They either hire me, which is awesome, or they don't hire me, which quite honestly isn't so awesome. Or I may choose not to take their listing. Why would you choose not to take my listing? There you go. That's what I'm looking for, guys. I want the seller to ask. Now, if they don't, I'm just going to I'm going to transition to the next part of the conversation, which I'll share with you in just a moment. And let's go with Levi's response. Levi, you know, that's a great question. Super glad you asked. I think you're going to love the answer. You see, if I feel that a seller has a goal or an expectation that cannot be met or exceeded, I would rather turn the opportunity down today than let you down six months from now. That makes sense. Yeah. All right, let's pause, guy, and get out of guys. Let's get out of the role play and just have a quick conversation about this. So, whenever I meet with a potential seller, one of three things typically happens. One of those three things will happen today. Either they understand and appreciate the benefits that I have to offer. All right, I want you to hear something here because I'm not making it about the person sitting across the table. You could do that, and I feel this is much more effective. In other words, I could say, Daryl, one of three things typically happens. One of those three things will happen today. Either you'll understand and appreciate the benefits that I offer, and you'll hire me, which is awesome. Or you may not hire me, which isn't so awesome. Now it's personal. Now it's about Daryl. And I just basically told Daryl that if he doesn't hire me, it's because he doesn't understand and appreciate the benefits that I have to offer. In other words, he's dumb. And another way for me to say this, Daryl, you may be really smart and hire me, or you may be dumb as dirt and not hire me. That's not going to go over very well, right? So we're going to make it about somebody else. Jessica, whenever I meet with a potential seller, one of three things typically happens. One of those three things will happen today. Either they understand and appreciate the benefits that I have to offer and they hire me, which is awesome. Or they may not hire me, which honestly isn't so awesome. And the third thing that occasionally happens is I may choose not to take the listing. Now, I want you to hear again, we're talking about this franchised listing presentation. Again, I can go to Chick-fil-A in Tampa or I can go to Chick-fil-A in Charlotte, North Carolina, it's exactly the same experience. What if you learned a listing presentation that you could share to everybody who's a part of your team? Daryl, she's adorable. She's adorable. Future realtor in the room. Thank you. Adorable. All right. When you have this franchise listing presentation, you can get off topic and talk to Daryl about his daughter and get right back on because you know you've got this franchise listing presentation you know exactly word for word what it sounds like when how why everything that you do now 
The reason I would turn down somebody's listing, and you may be wondering why I would do that, is because if I feel that they have a goal that cannot be met or an expectation that cannot be exceeded, I did not say if I feel like they have a goal that I can't meet or an expectation that I can't exceed because now it's about me. I want this to be about them. It's their goals, their expectations. If they have a goal or an expectation that cannot be met or exceeded, I would rather turn the opportunity down today than let them down six months from now. Now, I'm going to teach you how to set yourself up for success when you know you have competition. So, Gina, you know that they're meeting with another realtor tomorrow. And you're going to tell them, now, because I know you're meeting with other real estate agents, you're going to meet with somebody who needs your listing. The good news for you is I don't need your listing. Now, you need to transition really fast right here because otherwise it's a very arrogant comment. Right? The good news for you is I don't need your listing. I want to work for you. And that's why I'm here. But because I don't need your listing, I'm not going to tell you something you want to hear just to put a sign in your yard. And because you're going to meet with other real estate agents, you'll probably meet with that agent. And you see, if I feel that a seller has a goal or an expectation that I can't meet or exceed, that cannot be met or exceeded, <laughs> I would rather turn the opportunity down than let you down. Now, fast forward a, a day later and they're meeting with that other real estate agent and that agent is giving them sale prices that they know are unrealistic. And they're going to remember the conversation that I had, that you had with them. And they're going to say, Randy told us this was going to happen. Gina told us this was going to happen. This, that, this agent is just saying anything we want to hear so they could put a sign in your yard. You set them up for failure. Because you would rather turn the opportunity down than let them down. Because you don't need their listing. It's a good place to come from. All right, so the third thing that may happen that happens occasionally is I, I may choose to turn the listing down. Now, the reason for that is if a seller has a goal or an expectation that cannot be met or exceeded, I would rather turn the opportunity down today than let you down six months from now. Does that make sense? All right. Transition statement. We're going to go right into a needs analysis. Now, because of because of those um, because of my mission statement, because my mission statement is to meet your goals and exceed your expectations, I need to ask you a couple of questions. Is that okay? Randy, on a scale of one to 10, with one being not so good and 10 being awesome, what needs to happen in the sale of your home for you to feel the experience was a 10? I need to walk away from this deal with at least $300,000, so money. Okay, so you need to walk away with at least $300,000. Got it. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what does that do for you? Well, what that'll do is give me the money I need to move to buy a new home. Okay. So you need to walk away with $300,000 in order to buy the next house. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Now, if we could accomplish a second goal, so that this would be a 10 plus experience, what's next? Uh, time. I need to have this done, everything within like 60 days. Okay, so you want to be under contract and at the closing table within 60 days. Correct. All right. What does that do for you? Uh, well, what that would do for me is that I have a job offer waiting in Atlanta, and that will put me right in the time frame so I need to be in Atlanta. Got it. Okay. So we need to have a contract and close within 60 days in order for mm -hmm. you to be in Atlanta on time to start your new job. Right. Okay. Now, if we could accomplish a third goal so that this would be a 10 plus plus experience, what's next? 
Well, the last time I went through this process, it was a lot of hiccups, a lot of issues with the transaction, and I just want everything to go smooth. I'm on a time frame, I'm on a budget, and and that's the last thing I need is for things to start to get rough and fall apart. Got it. So tell me what does smooth look like? Look like? Well, smooth looks like me being able to obviously get my price. Yeah. To within a sixty day period, and not to have any um any any catch up any catch up. <laughs> or anything like that any anything that's going to stop us from moving forward and getting uh to atlanta in 60 days got it okay if it makes sense i totally understood you my friend you're all good i'm not going to go get the catch up though <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> all right so jessica if we could nail one of these goals if if you could achieve one of your three goals, what's number one? I really need to be there on time. That's non-negotiable. Okay. So if we have a contract within 30 days, you're sitting at the closing table within 60 days, and you're in Atlanta in time to start your new job. Um, however, there's a few more hiccups than you expected. And you walked away with less than $300,000. That would still be a 10 for you. Yes, because we're achieving my number one goal. Got it. All right. If we could accomplish a second goal and we've hit two of your goals and we missed one, what's the second most important goal? For it to be a smooth transaction. I realize that sometimes there's a trade-off for speed and convenience. Yeah, okay. So what I'm hearing is we need a contract within 30 days, close within 60 days so that you can be in Atlanta in time to start your new job, that you have a smooth um, closing without a whole lot of hiccups. And if you don't get your price, it's a 10. That was a successful sale. Correct. Okay. Good job, Jessica. So let's pause for a moment, guys. Real life. First of all, that happens real life. Another thing that will happen in real life is you'll have a seller say, well, my number one goal is money. And it's important that you walk through this process with them because until they've gone through this process with you, they don't even know what their goals are, all right? So MJ, what would happen in that situation is if Jessica said money, I would go back through the three and I would say, okay, so we're going to net $300,000. However, it takes a little longer than 60 days to get you closed. So you're not in Atlanta in time to start that new job. And there's a few more hiccups than you expected, but you got your net of 300,000. Would that be a successful sale? Now, at that point, Jessica more than likely would say, no, I've got to be in Atlanta and start that new job. So what I would say at that point was, okay, so what I'm hearing you say is having your property under contract and closed in 60 days is really your number one goal. And Jessica would respond, yeah, it is. So what we've done is we've changed the order of those goals critically important. Critically important for Jessica because when we have a pricing strategy, she's going to she's going to make a decision on the right price to get her property sold based on being in Atlanta in sixty days, not based on walking away with three hundred thousand dollars. If I allow her to make a decision based on walking away with three hundred thousand dollars, there's a really good chance that I'm setting her up for failure in her number one goal which is be in Atlanta in 60 days to start a new job. And she hasn't even thought about this until we sat down at the kitchen table. This is one of the things that separates you guys from all of the other realtors, because they don't do this. They just walk in the door and diagnose without asking any questions, without doing any kind of x-rays. You walk into the doctor's office and they say, 
jump up on that table. I'm going to open you up and start looking around. Um, no, I'm leaving. Is this making sense? This part's really important, everybody, before I go further. So needs analysis, prioritize needs. This, These two things are probably the most two important ingredients to this recipe. Leave one of these out and you're going to end up with a different result. Don't do one of these exactly the way I'm teaching you to do it and you're going to end up with a different result. This needs analysis and prioritizing their needs is one of the things that absolutely separates you from everybody else. Now, by the way, for those of you who have been working buyers for a long time, you do this with your buyers. Tell me what needs to happen in the purchase of your home for you to feel the experience was a success. What does that look like? Why is that important to you? The process is called going three deep. And the reason we go three deep is because the answer is never up here on the surface. The answer is always down here. But you've got to go deep in order to find the real answer. Now, after you prioritize their needs, you're going to trial close. It's not written in here, but you are. So once I've gone through Randy's goals with him, I've got everything written in a notebook in front of me because I took notes as Randy was sharing because I'm conveying, I care about you. You can trust me. I know what I'm doing. Randy, if I could show you that I'm the right agent in order to achieve these goals. Are you ready to get started today? Um, that's possible, John, but I just had a question. Quick question. Yep. Your commission. <laughs> I think you had said it was 6%. And, man, I, I'm just telling you, I, I, I'm not prepared to pay 6%. So, so glad he did that, everybody. What do you think I would do at this point? Let me answer it for you. Jessica, let's... Let's go for it. Hang on. Sorry. You're good. Am I? Oh, I am unmuted. Okay. Randy, I'm really glad that you asked that question. You're absolutely right. Today, my fee is 6%. And if that needs to change down the road to get a deal done, we can adjust at that time. But today it is 6%. Well done, Jessica. Well done. All right, can I make, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plus that, okay? Here's what I would do. I would pull this back out. In other words, Randy, it sounds like you have another goal. Mm -hmm. Possible. Right? So I'm gonna add a fourth goal. It sounds like you're looking for a real estate agent that would discount their fee. Is that one of your goals? Is that one of the things that needs to happen for you to feel that you had a successful sale. Well, if 6% is considered a discount agent, then John, uh, you would have to be a discount agent then. Yeah, so for the purpose of antitrust law, especially with this being recorded, not discussing fees. All right, now I'm back <laughs> at the kitchen table, right? And I trial closed. My trial close was, Randy, if I could show you that I'm the right agent in order to get these goals accomplished, would you hire me today? Um, everything sounds good, John. So yes, I think we could move forward. All right. Now, let me answer the commission question, okay? Because if the answer was what Randy said initially about the commission, I would go right back to, it sounds like we have another goal, Randy. So goal number four is you're looking for a real estate agent that's willing to discount their fees. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Tell me what that looks like. Less than 6%. <laughs> all right. Someone that can do everything you say you, you can do for me, get my home sold, do all these things, and but not charge a 6% fee. Fair enough. That's what it looks like. Okay. And what would that do for you? It'd give me a little bit more money that I would need uh, in Atlanta. I understand. Yeah. Now, in prioritizing your goals, we discovered that having a contract and closing within 60 days 
uh, so you could be in Atlanta in time to start your new job was the number one mm -hmm. goal. Is that still goal number one? It is. Yeah. And, and you also shared with me that having a hassle-free sale without a whole lot of speed bumps was the second most important goal. Yeah, no catch up. Yes. <laughs> right. And goal number three was to net $300,000. So where does this fourth goal fall into that list? Well, you know, the other three are more important. This is at the bottom of the list. Fair enough. I mean, actually, it, it really is. All right. So if Randy is on the witness stand and I'm cross-examining, I just, he's toast. You guys get it? That's true. Right? Because he just said, it's really not that important to me. I'm going to make a decision on who's going to give me the best opportunity to have a contract and close on my home in 60 days. Now, you guys as real estate agents, you're hung up on it because you feel like this is something that you're going to have to deal with in order to get their listing, not necessarily. When you focus on who's going to give them the best opportunity to get their property under contract in 30 days and close in 60 days, that's what's most important to them. Price only matters in the absence of value. If you're not delivering value, price matters. When you are delivering value, it won't even come up. All right, we prioritize and we trial close. And from there, we go to our marketing strategy in order to get their home sold and our service plan. <clears throat> what I recommend is you customize your marketing strategy just like you've been doing. Now, for me, one of the questions that I get a lot when I'm teaching my 14 point listing presentation is what kind of visuals did I use? And, and the answer is none. I didn't take a listing presentation. I didn't have a PowerPoint. Uh, this, what I'm doing today is really out of my comfort zone. I'd rather just be sitting at a table having a conversation with you. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't because you can. But what I would do is I would just give them a list of everything that I'm going to do to get their home under, to get their home sold, what I'm going to do to market their property in order to attract the right buyers. Now, I want you, what I want you to do when it comes to this conversation is understand there's a difference between marketing and marketing to attract the right buyers. Because we can do a great job of marketing, and if we're attracting the wrong buyers, it ain't going to make a bit of difference. For example, if you take a listing at $550,000 and you know the right price for that property is 475 to 500 and you're marketing the heck out of that property at 550, all you're doing is telling more people that it's overpriced. That's the only thing your marketing is accomplishing. And who are you attracting? Well, you're attracting buyers who are looking up to 550, which are the wrong buyers. So now what's happening, you're selling the competition because they're using your home to compare to those other properties that are priced correctly between 500 and 550, and they're bigger, they're newer, they have more updates, they're in a better location, and you sold the competition. So Make sure they know what you're going to do to market their property in order to attract the right buyers. Now, one of the things that I would share with you that's going to give you a competitive advantage over everybody else, because very few people are willing to do this. So one of the things I'm going to do in order to sell your home, Randy, and one of the things I'm going to do in order to sell your home, MJ, is I'm going to call between 60 and 80 buyers every day looking for a buyer for your home. Now, Levi, they may ask you, well, how are you going to do that? All right, let's say that they're an expired listing. I'm sitting at your kitchen table because your home was off, came off the market as an expired listing. I'm going to remind you that when I called you, one of the questions I asked you was, if your home would have sold, where are you moving to? If you're a buy owner, when your home sells, Joanne, where are you moving to? Tell me what you're looking for. Now, you might describe the home I'm listing today. 
you might describe the your home. And I just found a buyer for you, didn't I? And because other real estate agents don't do this, they go to the office and they stare at their phone and they wait for it to ring. They, they don't have as good a chance to get your home sold as I do. All right, service plan. What are you doing to service your listings? Are you, when, when you have a showing on their home, are you calling to get feedback? How many times are you calling to get feedback? How many different ways are you attempting to get feedback so you can call your seller and let them know what the buyer thought, what the other real estate agent thought? How many days after that showing are you going to get feedback? If you don't put this in writing, if you don't explain this to them, they're going to have an expectation that you're calling them five minutes after that showing with feedback. And Emma, because you're calling the next day and you think that's amazing because nobody does that. They're mad at you because you didn't call five minutes after the showing. So you got to let them know, here's my plan. When you have a showing on Monday, we call for feedback and deliver that feedback on Wednesday. Our feedback calls are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we'll call you and we'll give you feedback from previous days. So on Monday, we're given feedback from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then on Wednesday, we're given feedback from Monday and Tuesday. Now, in addition to that, I'm gonna call you once a week. It's Wednesdays. I'm gonna call. I'm going to call you and I'm just going to talk about the market. I'm going to let you know how many days your home has been on the market, how many showings we have, how many showings we've had. Uh, if any of the homes you were competing with went under contract, it's, it's my weekly call just to keep you updated with what's going on in the market. The number one complaint that homeowners have when it comes to real estate agents is lack of communication. That's a bigger complaint than the home not selling. Now, if the home's been on the market for 30 days, 60 days or longer, they may be a little bit frustrated that it hasn't sold yet, but not as frustrated as they will be if you don't call them. So have a, have a system for communication. All right. Pricing strategy. All right. There's a big difference between discussing market value and pricing strategy. Pricing strategy is the right price to get your home under contract and closed within 60 days so that you could be in Atlanta in time to start that new job. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull all of the comparable solds in your neighborhood. Whether, let me say that again. I'm going to pull every single home that sold in your neighborhood in the last six months, whether it's comparable or not, because I'm not leaving any stone unturned. Lewis, my friend, it's great to see you. It's dark there. I think he's eight hours ahead of us, six hours ahead. Lewis, what time is it there? Hi. <laughs> what, what, uh, what what time is it the there? Time? It's uh let me see. Uh 27 minutes past 7 p.m. 27 minutes <laughs> past 7. All right. Yeah. I am so, so glad that you found, you found us and that you are here today all the way from Portugal. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I was in the middle of the traffic, so I I heard you all the time, but um, always driving. <laughs> well, so, so glad you're here. It looks beautiful there. Thank you. Yes. All right. So, pricing strategy. I'm going to pull all of the properties in the neighborhood that sold in the last six months, whether they're comparable or not. Now, I'm going to go through those homes, and I'm looking at square footage. I'm looking at beds, baths the year it was built, how big the lot is. Uh, and then I'm looking at the, the, the description. I'm looking specifically for anything that would add value to this property. Now, I'm going to use a highlighter and I'm going to highlight all of these things because I don't want to sit at the kitchen table um, 
spending an hour on each property that I pulled. I would just want to focus on the things that really matter and get rid of all of the fluff. So if it's updated kitchen, for example, I'm going to highlight that. That makes a difference. I am looking for a property that is within 10% of your home. So if Gina has a home that's 3,000 square foot, I'm looking 2,700 square foot to 3,300 square foot. Now, before I go through the comparables with you at the kitchen table, I'm going to let Tulio know, Tulio, I brought everything that sold in your neighborhood because I don't leave any stone unturned. Script. However, some of these homes are not comparable to your home. So when we get to those, I'll simply let you know and we'll put those off to the side. Our goal here is to find two, three if possible, properties that have sold that are as close to identical to your home as possible. Our goal is also to find a couple properties, two or three, that are currently for sale that are also as comparable to your home as possible. Now guys, as you're going through these comparables with them, you're simply, you have the property with you, you printed a copy of it or it's on your computer screen and you're gonna start with just the basics and is this home comparable or is it not? Now, if it's comparable, you're gonna go deeper. If it's not comparable, you're just gonna let them know this property is not comparable. You're gonna let them know why it's not and you're gonna push it off to the side. Now, you have identified two or three properties that sold in the last six months that are comparable you are going to create a high to low number. In other words, on the low end, this property we're looking at 540. On the high end, we're looking at 580. And we're basing those prices on the comparable homes that are as comparable to the subject property as possible. Now, I'm gonna let the seller know as I'm presenting this to them, on the low end, we're at 540. Now, I want shock. I want them to respond with, what? No way my home is worth more than that. So on the low end, Tulio, I'm looking at 540. On the high end, I'm seeing 580. Now, Tulio takes a deep breath and he's like, oh, that's better. All right, so on the high end, we're looking at 580. And then somewhere in the middle, we're, we're around 550. Now, 540 is too low. Now they really like you because you just eliminated that one they don't like. 580 is too high. So where do you think we need to be? Well, you only left them one option. It's 550. Now, they're either going to agree with you or they're not. Now, if they don't, if they say, I still think it's 580. Put the comparable properties back in front of them. All right, and just ask them to show you where they're seeing that. In other words, Gina, I'm not seeing 580. I'd love to see 580, but I'm not seeing that. Can you help me show me where you got that number? Now, sellers go to script school too. The good news for you is they don't learn a lot of scripts. It's like five or six of them. And one of their scripts is we can always lower the price later. Another one of their scripts is a buyer can always make an offer. Here's a challenge with that. We've got a window of opportunity when that home first goes on the market. And a lot of people think, well, the window of opportunity is two weeks or it's 30 days. No, it's when that it's when the buyer first sees the home. And we don't know which buyer is the right buyer. It might be day one. And that buyer comes out to see the home and it's at 580. That same buyer would have made an offer at 550. Absolutely would have. But they're not going to make an offer at 580. Now, two weeks later, the seller decides they're going to lower the price to 550. The challenge is that buyer that would have given them 550, they've moved on. They've already bought another house. And we, we lost the best opportunity that we were going to have in that 30 days to get their home sold. Here's the other challenge with that. When you 
start high because you can lower later or a buyer can always make an offer. What you typically do is you typically chase the market down. So when the market shifts from less than 30 days of inventory, prices are going up, up, up to more than 90 days of inventory, now you have sellers that are competing for buyers versus buyers that are competing competing for sellers. You've got three sellers competing for every one buyer. And the only way I win that competition is price. Now I'm lowering my price in order to get my home sold. And when I do that, the price of everybody's home in the neighborhood just came down. In a seller's market, the last home that sold creates a new floor, meaning the next home that sells is going to sell for more. In a buyer's market, the last home that sold creates a new ceiling, which means the next home that sells is going to sell for less. The more ways you can convey this to the seller, the better. One of the other ways is use a fishing analogy. Tulio, if you hired me to take you fishing, and I know right where the fish are, and I take you to that spot, and I've got the right bait, the right fishing equipment, and we hang our bait three feet above the water. How many fish are we going to catch? Don't say, well, if it's a flying fish. Don't say that. I've heard it a thousand times. And we got to get our bait down in there where the, the bait down where the fish are. All right, part of pricing strategy is to do a supply and demand analysis. Now, a, su a supply and demand analysis is simply a math equation, A. A is the number of active listings within a $50,000 price range. Within hey John, before you do that, can I ask you a question about uh, price really quick? Yep. How do you feel about price bracketing? Like, um... So say we did the CMA and we come up with the price 500,000. A lot of people like to do 499. Uh -huh. But um, how do you feel about 499 versus 500? Yeah, that's a common question, Daryl. So it, it's, I've done both. Now at 500,000, you're at the high end between 450 and 500. And you're at the low end between 500 and 550. That and I feel like if somebody's searching for 500 to 550, they're going to miss your 499. I, I I'm worried about that as well. All right. So. Um, and you said it so much better than I did. I didn't practice that. I get the whole idea between, well, now I can go fishing in two ponds. Well, that's fine, but one of them is wrong. So why fish there anyways? Pick the one that's right and position yourself to beat the competition. All right, math equation. A is active listings between 450 and 500 or 500 and 550, or 700 and 750, wherever your subject property is, okay? It's a $50,000 price range within a two to three mile radius of the subject home. B is properties that have sold, same geographic area, same price range, five to 550, six to 650, seven to 750, whatever that price range is. C is B divided by six. In other words, if there were 24 properties that sold, I'm going to divide 24 by six, that's four, which means C is four, or four homes being sold every 30 days. D is A divided by C, which is if there are 36 properties for sale, and I'm dividing 36 by four, because four are selling every 30 days, then I have a nine month supply of inventory. Now, if you're selling a property that has less than 60 days of inventory, there's 12 homes for sale, and there's seven selling every 30 days, you've got less than 60 days of inventory, you can afford to price 1%, maybe 2% above market value, and you're still going to be okay. However, as soon as that thing goes more than 90 days over the over. Um, 
90 days of inventory, 90 or more days of inventory. Now you have buyers start to be a little bit more picky, okay? Because there's nine homes being sold and there's three selling every 30 days. Buyers can afford to be a little bit more picky. Here's the other thing. Buyers are paying attention. They see the market shifting and they know they're buying at a time when prices are probably going to come down and they're looking for a great deal. So pricing strategy, how do you sell your home in that market? Well, you've got to be top 25% in condition, bottom 25% in price. So you've got 12 homes for sale. You've got four selling every 30 days. That's 90 days of inventory. You look, the, the top 25% are the top four. So if you looked at your home and you, and you, and you ask the question, how do I compete? Well, are you one of the top four properties and how your home shows? If the answer is yes, I am, cool, then you're on the right path, but you're not finished yet. The, the second part of this is, are you one of the bottom 25% when it comes to price? Because that's what buyers are looking for. They're looking for top 25% and how the home shows and bottom 25% in price. And you might be looking at a situation where you've got a home that could sell 590 to 600. Let's just say market value, praise value is 600. And you're pricing that property at 592. You're pricing it below market value. But that's what it's gonna to take to get the home sold because you're competing against 12 other homes and only four homes are gonna win. And what you're also doing, if you look at the market and the market's starting to do this, we're gonna see prices start to creep lower. You're pricing ahead of the market. Instead of, instead of chasing the market, you're pricing ahead of the market and you're creating the market. Now, remember sellers go to script school. I don't wanna give my home away. Another one of their favorite scripts. Well, if we sold your home for 592 and a year from now, you're no longer living in your home, but the value of the home has dropped to 570. You sold it for 592. You wanted 600, but you sold it for 592. And the value today is 570. Did you give your home away? No, they didn't. Price ahead of the market in order to sell your home strategic pricing professional, this is what you've got to do in, in a shifting market in order to sell. Now, one of the things you're going to see is some listings will sit on the market and they won't sell. And sellers are going to realize that not every listing sells. As a matter of fact, it might be 50%. So 50% of everything that's on the market comes off the market. It might go lower than that. So if you didn't get the listing the first time, rather than beating yourself for, up for not getting the listing, ask yourself, did they price it right to sell? And if the answer is no, then just keep checking back because it's coming off the market. Go get it the next time. Joanne. Can you repeat your formula for the inventory? Yeah. A is active listings. $50,000 price range within a two to three mile radius of the subject property. B is solds, $50,000 price range, same price in, range. In what period of time? We're going to go back six months. Six months. Okay. Now, the I reason got is, is because it's a, it's a math equation and we need the data. It's not because those homes are comparable. It has nothing to do with that. Well, all we're trying to figure out is how many homes are selling between 550 and and and, and 600,000 within a two to three mile radius of our, our, our customer's home um, so that we know what demand is. Then we're gonna figure out supply. We're gonna, we're gonna take supply and we're gonna divide it by demand and that's going to tell us what our absorption ratio is. It's going, to, it's going to tell us how many months of inventory we have. All right. Close. Step 14. I'm not going to give you a whole lot of closes. 
I've got one. Are you ready to get started? Now, what I will do is I'll give you responses. All right, are you ready to get started? Yes. Pull out the paperwork and start filling it out. <laughs> All right, if you hear no, I want you to respond to no with a one to 10 close. In other words, I asked Gina, are you ready to get started? Gina says, John, I like what you said, but no, not yet. Gotcha. So just out of curiosity, Gina, on a scale of one to 10, with one being, you don't like anything I said and you can't wait for me to leave, and 10 being, I'm the right agent for the job. Where are we? Gina says, John, you're an eight. Cool. What would it take for me to be a 10? And whatever her answer is, that's the objection you need to overcome. All right. Let's say you hear, I need to think about it. That's going to be a common one, right? So one of my responses to I need to think about it is, That makes sense. And I know that we've been sitting here for just over a couple hours. I'm sure that I've gotten some phone calls and text messages. Why don't I go out to my car, return a couple calls, return text messages, and you come out and get me when you're ready. Does it work? Yes. Does it always work? No and it'll never work when you don't try it. So I need to think it over. Offer to go outside, give them time to think it over and come and get you when they're done. If they respond with just not comfortable with the commission. Okay, so it's a commission objection. So isolate, two different ways to isolate a commission objection. One, other than commission, is there any reason why you wouldn't hire me today? Here's another one, and I prefer the second one. MJ, if I were willing to discount my fee, would you hire me today? She says, yes. Now, my response to that is awesome. Now you have two choices, guys. You can start filling out the paperwork and you got the listing. Or you could respond with, Okay, so if I were willing to discount my fee, you would hire me today. Can I share with you why that concerns me? You see, when, when somebody asks me if my fee is negotiable, I'm also hearing them ask how good of a negotiator I am. And you see, the good news for you is I'm a really good negotiator. You see, if I were willing to give away my money that I use to support my family that quickly, how quickly would I give away your money when we have an offer on your home? You see, if you hire a limited service discount agent and, and you tell that agent that you want 700,000, but your bottom line is 680. And I know you are going to tell them that because you told me. Now that agent gets an offer for 670 and their response is that's awesome because she'll sell her home for 680. Now you just hold your, sold your home for 680 when you might have been able to get 700 for it. But because that agent was willing to give away their money to get your listing, they gave away your money and you sold it for 680 when you could have sold it for 700. Now you lost $20,000 trying to make an extra 7,000. Are you okay with that? Now, if you're asking me if my fee is negotiable, the answer is yes. When we have an offer on your home, if I need to give up money in order to make the deal work, I will because I'm a deal maker, not a deal breaker. Are you ready to get started? All right, I can keep going for another hour or two, but I'm not going to because we're right at three o'clock. And I think I promised you the longest it would take was two hours. I'm gonna stop share and change my screen.
means stop record.